got a real treat for you here. We've got um, Randy Durr and Mark Jones are going to talk to us about machining parts for model cars. We've got an actual lathe. Maybe they'll build something for us right here. So uh, put your orders in. They might stay here all afternoon if you want to <laughs> have some parts made. But uh, we really appreciate their, being, their willingness to do this for us. It's something that's of interest to probably most of us, if not all of us. And uh, I want to mention the sponsor, Paul in is sponsoring this seminar. We're, we appreciate him doing that. So without any more delay, we'll turn it over to you guys. Great. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm Randy Durr, and this is Mark Jones, my partner in this. And uh, as it turned out, uh, Mark Gustafson kind of put us together to put this uh, seminar on for you all today. And we didn't know it at the time, but in the end, it worked out to be a nice complementary set of uh, capabilities here because I primarily use a metal lathe to make a lot of my parts, and Mark uses almost exclusively a, a mill, a metal mill, to make his parts. So you'll be able to get the perspective from each of us on those two different uh, machine tools that uh, we use for our uh, different projects. So thank you all for attending. Really appreciate uh, seeing all the faces out there. Hope everyone's having a great time. Yeah, anybody not having fun? Get out of here. But, uh, and thanks to everyone who puts on the GSL. Thanks to Don for the, the loaning of his lathe here today so we can do some demos. And uh, thanks to Mark and his team for putting on just such a great show every two years for us to come and enjoy. So. With that, we'll get to get on the way here. Uh, going to go through a bit of an agenda here. Uh, we're going to cover definition machining, the basics, a little bit of description of the machine tools we're talking about. We've got some information in here, a lathe buyer's guide, as I call it, as well as a mill buyer's guide. Not going to spend a lot of time on that part of it, but it's in the presentation materials, so when you can download it later from the museum site, you'll have that information available to you as you maybe think of a purchase of a lathe or a mill in the future. Uh, just for general idea here, how many of you already have one, of, one or both of these two machine tools and use it regularly? Oh, excellent. So we've got about a 50-50 split here of, of people who are familiar with the equipment and others who may not be as uh, familiar with it. And then we're going to show a number of uh, examples, photos, of parts that are made on lathes and mills. I've brought a lot of sample parts here as well. And then we'll get into the Q&A slash machining demo, and we'll just do a real simple part here. For, for those of you who maybe aren't familiar with how a lathe works or how a mill works, you'll get to see at least how the lathe uh, functions here. And then at the tail end of the presentation, again, not to go through today, but for the handout, are all the references. There's a lot of good online sources for machine tools out there for us, scale hobbyists. So first of all, what's machining? Thought we better lay the groundwork here. And it's any of the various processes in which a piece of raw material, metal, plastic, whatever, wood, is cut into a desired final shape and size by a controlled material removal process. A lot of great work there. More specifically, if I'm talking about machining on a lathe, that involves cutting a piece of raw material while it is spinning and the tool is stationary and that creates various round shapes. With a mill, by contrast, you have the cutting tool itself is rotating or spinning, and you can move it in an X, Y, Z motion. Everybody understand what I mean there? Left, right, in and out, and up and down. And then you remove the material from your, from your raw material piece, which is, is mounted to the, uh, the compound on the uh, device. And that lets you do a lot of different things. The way I think of it is a lathe makes parts round, so it makes round parts. And a mill, with its XYZ capability, allows you to machine flat surfaces, or angled faces, or even contours with some of the uh, fancier controls. All right, a little bit of a uh, aptitude test here. How many of you in this room have taken a piece of wood, plastic, aluminum, brass, and reshaped it using a knife, a file, a piece of sandpaper, or some other tool? All right, good. You're all capable of being machinists. You all pass the test. Because in effect, that's really all you're doing. It's just a little more automated with a lathe or a mill. Whittling, as you know, is shaving a chip from a piece of raw material, typically wood. We think of whittling with wood, but you can whittle plastic and you can whittle aluminum. And you do that with a knife blade or a chisel, some kind of sharp tool. Machining is the same kind of thing 
only instead of you controlling both the position of the tool and the workpiece, some of those positions are controlled for you automatically in the device itself. And again, with uh, the lathe, it's the workpiece rotating against the tool. With the mill, it's the tool rotating against the workpiece. So there's whittling. And you see, you're making a chip. That little curl of material there is a chip. Well, with a lathe, you're doing the same thing. It's a chip being cut off of the round stock by a sharp tool, uh, typically uh, a high-speed steel cutting tool or a carbide cutting tool, but in the end it has a sharp edge and you rotate the workpiece and make that chip. The mill, again, kind of the contrast to that in that you have multiple cutting surfaces or it's like a, a bunch of little knives in a pattern and you rotate that cutting tool against the piece itself and remove a number of chips. So, this is going to be the complex part. We're going to go through each one of these pieces and put everybody to sleep. No, sorry. I just put this in here for reference again. This is a metal lathe. This happens to be a picture from Sherline. And it shows all the main components of, a, of their lathe anyway. Um, the most important things to, to know about are you have the, the chuck, which holds your workpiece. You have a tool holder or tool post. That holds your cutting tool. And that is mounted on a compound, which lets you move that cutting tool toward the stock, away from the stock, left to right across the, the side of the stock while it rotates with that chuck. There's a lot of other bits and pieces here, and if you're familiar with the equipment, you'll learn about those, or if you have your own, eventually you'll get to learn what those do. With a mill, it's a lot of similarities in that you have the XY compound there at the bottom but that's where the workpiece actually gets clamped to. So now you're moving the workpiece in and out and left and right. And the tool, the cutting tool mounts in the chuck, which is now in a vertical orientation. And you can move that up and down to remove metal in the Z direction. And you have your drive motors, you have your control screws and all that. But again, very, very much similar uh, technology between lathes and mills in that respect. So if you're looking to buy a lathe, what might you consider? Well, you might consider buying a new one. There's a number of them available in the market. Mark is very familiar with the Sherline uh, products. He uses one of their mills. And the lathe both. Mill, the mill and the lathe, yes. Yeah, okay. And then there's this whole collection. If you go out there online, if you're looking for a, a new a lathe, called a mini lathe, seven inch model, you'll find it, it looks a lot the same. Maybe it's red, maybe it's blue, maybe it's green, depending on who you buy it from. They're all available from Little Machine Shop, uh, Cummins Industrial, Enco, Grizzly, Harbor Freight has one. Those uh, lathes are all of a similar uh, construction. There's the Sherline. Again, this is what uh, Mark uses. Uh, it's definitely a hobbyist lathe. It's, it's uh, light duty. It's small, compact. It uh, will do anything you need for your model cars, but don't try to turn the crank for your small block Chevy on. <laughs> Not going to happen. The mini lathe, a little bit, a little bit more industrial in nature. It's bigger, it's heavier. One of the secrets with machine tools is stability. Stability of that workpiece relative to that cutting tool. You don't want unnecessary flex, you don't want unnecessary vibration because that will affect how the parts turn out. No pun intended. But, uh, so this one is all steel cast iron steel pieces versus the aluminum extrusions on the uh, on the Sherline if you go back let's see the Sherline oh, went too far the Sherline the a lot of the, the compound is extruded aluminum which is fine again for for brass aluminum plastic parts when you're machining those but if you need a little bit more strength you really need to get a more solid machine so this is the mini lathe it's available under a number of different uh, companies and do your research. Uh, what I found is littlemachineshop.com is a wealth of information. Highly recommend go to their site, spend some time there, especially if you're looking to purchase a mill or a lathe, or if you're looking to buy tools or chucks or anything for your existing piece of equipment. And they compare all these different mini lathes, and it's a good thing to run through, if, again, if you're looking to purchase. And that's just a continuation of that data. I myself have a 
uh, Atlas, a six-inch Atlas. It's also uh, branded under the Craftsman name, the old Sears Craftsman. Uh, mine is as old as I am. It's from 1957, mm -hmm. but it, and it probably runs better than I do. But if you take care of them, they'll run forever. They'll last forever if you don't abuse them and don't, don't do the wrong things. And these lays are particularly popular among hobbyists because these were originally created by the Atlas Company who made full-size machine tools and they basically took their bigger industrial lathes and they scaled them down. All the features are still there, all the functions are still there because they used them for training in trade schools and high school shop classes and things like that. So it has the back drive gears so you can turn threads, it has the tailstock, the headstock, all the different features of a full-size lathe are here. And these are still out there, you can find them online, eBay, that kind of thing used. Um, I remember when I purchased mine back in the early 80s, I think it was about 300 at the time, and I remember that pretty distinctly because my wife and I were newly married and I needed this lathe, but somehow curtains for the house became a higher priority. And I just, that took about a year to overcome that, but eventually we did, we got the lathe and we were able to uh, start learning how to machine things. So that's another option for, for a used lathe. Uh, for the mills, it's kind of the same sort of story. You've got the Sherline product line, which is again a great lay or mill for the hobbyist. You also have the mini mill, which is kind of the cousin to the mini lathe. Again, available from all those same suppliers. There's the Sherline mill, uh, similar in construction to their lathe. In fact, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you can convert one to the other and the other to one, right? I believe there's a lathe. Uh mill conversion for the lathe, and the problem with it is if you set up, you have to change the setup back and forth. Yeah. Uh, I have both. It's very convenient. You go from one to the other. Okay. It, to me, it was worth the investment. It seems a little pricey up front. Right. But long term, if you're going to do this for, you know, four to five years, it's worth the money. Yeah. And you don't then have to have two pieces of equipment taking up space in your workshop. Um, you it, it doesn't take it. up that much space. No, because you can convert just the one to either I, usage. Well, I think the having the mill itself allows you more flexibility and more versatility uh, okay. than having the conversion to the lathe. I see. And for me, one of the benefits I like is I do all my fixturing to work on the mill knowing that I'm going to use the lathe to cut it off. Okay. So the lathe was, is a very expensive tool just to cut pieces off and make right. a mill, but it's really quick and easy. Yeah. yeah. Well, I like Greg Nichols' point that he made in his presentation last evening, if you were here, how he takes the part, leaves it in the chuck, and he can transfer it from the mill to the lathe and not lose center, not lose alignment, and so that's a that's yes, a wonderful I idea. Do the exact same thing. Yeah. Yes, I I should mention uh, back on the Atlas, uh, one of the things they did offer that I uh, that came with my lathe is called a milling attachment, and in effect, what it is is a, a clamping system that mounts on the compound. This being the compound, and you mount it here instead of the tool post, and it clamps up a piece of material. Then you put a cutting tool in the chuck on the headstock, and I can do simple milling. It's not very convenient, <laughs> but it works in a pinch. So there's that option as well. Randy, so there's, oh, yeah, sorry. Question? I started with the lathe with the milling attachment, and all it basically is, if you look at the mill there, it's that piece at the back. Okay. The piece at the back that the motor's mounted on just mounts, on, mounts where the motor Okay. Yeah. Stephen points out that he has this particular one with the, the lathe attachment, or milling attachment, excuse me. I started that way. Yeah, and basically this whole no, assembly. The piece at the back, the, the slide. Oh, the slide here. That part and the base part below it yep. will mount where the motor mounts on the lathe. That's okay, how it works. so that's how it works, and it yeah. converts, this all mounts where the motor mounts on the lathe and turns this drive unit into the drive unit for the lathe. Yeah, that, that's one of the nice things about a shear line, it's very modular. Yes. So yeah. I have a lathe base and a mill base, but I only have one motor. Okay, yeah, very good. So as he points out, the shear line is a more modular construction. You have one motor drive unit, you have a mill base, you have a lathe base, and it lets you transfer it between the two then. So thank you. The mini mill, again, this is from all those numerous suppliers that you see out there. Uh, Grizzly, Harper Freight, et cetera, Enco, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, again, these are all from the same basic factory in China. Uh, but if you look carefully at some of the specs, you could read that. There's subtle differences, like how many thousandths of an inch the 
table moves for one rotation. And a lot of them, I'm not sure where this came from, but they move 62 thousandths of an inch for a rotation, which is really odd. Most machine tools move 50 thousandths of an inch for a rotation. And that's important when you're trying to divide things up in thousands. So do your research if you're looking at one of these and uh, get uh, the parts that will make it work for you. So now we'll get into some lathe work examples. These are a number of different pieces that I have made over the years using uh, my lathe for different projects. In the, uh, and again, lathes make parts round, so you make round parts. And the wheel itself, uh, that outer rim up in the upper left hand corner, is a piece of plexiglass. It's machined. The spoke spider in the middle, actually the original disc was turned on the lathe. The spokes were added. And then once they were all glued and, and dried it in place, I was able to turn the angle on the back side of the spokes so it fits down into that clear rim. So it's actually two pieces. Uh, the next picture to the right, uh, expansion tank, oil filter. The uh, upper right picture shows uh, hubs and brake rotors and shock absorbers, air cleaners, things like that uh, that you can make on the lathe. The middle left uh, is the fire extinguisher and an oil tank. The middle, middle picture is again a brake rotor. Uh, on the middle right, the dry sump oil tank, the fan motor for the rear end cooler, the fuel pump uh, or oil pump uh, for that cooler. All those are lathe turn parts. The lower left hand picture, if you can squint and really see it, there's a tail light housing made for this hot, uh, street rod truck. And that was turned out of aluminum and the lens inside was turned out of clear plexi and then painted with transparent red paint and you have to get up real close to see it. The, but that's another lathe part. The silencer muffler on the header on the middle lower picture was another aluminum turning. And then finally, the lower right hand picture, that tire itself was machined on my lathe. I uh, machined it out of plexiglass and then cut the, the grooves around the tread and then the, the gator back uh, V part was actually engraved using a, a brass template and an engraver tool, just a vibrating engraver tool. But I held the part in the lathe and rotated it segment by segment to evenly space those uh, those uh, tread patterns. Question, Mike? Why did you choose uh, plexiglass on the tire and also that panel sport or any like style okay. as opposed to aluminum? Yep. Mike's asking why I chose plexiglass instead of aluminum or some other material. Um, some of that is legacy. When I built the, the white firebird that's pictured there in the middle, that was one of my first scratch building projects. Uh, and I actually had a friend at work machine the tires for me, and he used plexiglass. Uh, and I, so I just started using that because it was a familiar material. Plexiglass has the advantage of being relatively inexpensive. It's clear acrylic rod, really, or plexiglass is another name for it. It, uh, it is a little bit easier to to work with uh, more like plastic, if you prefer plastic, and over the metal. Uh, one disadvantage is it can be hard to see what you're doing because of it being clear. You oftentimes will have to shoot a coat of primer on it to check your progress. Uh, but uh, I don't know that there's any, if I, if I had to remake that, that wheel today, I don't know that I would use plexi. I may choose brass or aluminum now. It, at the time that that part was made, because that upper left-hand corner wheel was made for the Sunoco Camaro back in the early late 80s, early 90s, and so my experience with working with brass was not what it is today. So some, a lot of it's just familiarity, whatever you're comfortable with. Another question. Does that plexiglass get hot and like, does it melt? And the question is, does a plexiglass get hot and melt? And yes, that is a problem when you're turning plastic on a lathe or on a mill, you have to use sharp tools, you have to control your speed, usually turn it oftentimes slower than you would metal, and you have to take light cuts so that you don't generate a lot of friction, a lot of heat, and just melt the material. Now that's a very good question, that is a problem with that. Was there another question over here? Is there, is there any problem using a plastic wheel rather than a rubber wheel? Uh, oh, for tires? Yeah, the question is, does it matter what material you use for tires? Plastic, metal, 
rubber, whatever, relative to judging, it's hard to say. That's kind of up to the judges. Uh, if they look realistic, I think that's the bottom line. And so whatever material lets you achieve the most realistic appearance in the end, I think is the right answer for you. And like for, for, for me, the plexiglass, once you paint it with some flat black paint, do a little weathering of the tread, I think it comes off fairly effective. Uh, I also have made tires out of resin. I'm not, I used to make tires out of a urethane, so they had some compliance. But in the end, the surface finish, the sheen of that urethane wasn't as realistic as a flat black painted plexiglass tire. So again, it's the end result, I think, speaks for itself. <clears throat> when I cut plastics on my lathe, I use a drip cooler. Okay, and yeah, he mentioned yep, using uh, lubrication, a drip cooler uh, when you're machining. Uh, oftentimes, I try to just machine dry for just because it's cleaner. Yeah. But it's a very good point, especially when you're doing uh, the harder steels and even some brass uh, and aluminum uh, coolants can make a big difference in the results. So those are some of the examples of lathe parts. I have another page. Oh, sorry, got another page. Uh, another tire wheel assembly, again, out of plexiglass. Uh, the differential in the upper right-hand corner. Now, obviously, that's not all done on the lathe, but those side covers is where I started. I made a, a round cylinder with the two side covers as one piece and then started adding the other pieces to it. So a lot of, when you look at a part, you may say, well, I can't make that on the lathe. No, not the whole thing, but there are components of that piece that you need to break it down and say this part can be made on a lathe and then add it to another part made this way. Um, I think uh, that uh, Gene Wingrove's book explains that concept really well, of breaking things down into the basic shapes and, and making that way. Gerald. Gerald Wingrove, sorry, Gerald Wingrove, yeah, thanks. And then again, plexiglass tires and wheels. Uh, the brake rotor there is actually steel because I wanted it to look like steel and what's gonna look more like steel than steel. And then it gets that little flash corrosion on it like the car does when it sits. Uh, the shock absorbers in the lower left-hand corner are brass uh, tubing and brass ends machined on the lathe. The steering gear parts in the middle bottom are brass pieces. And then even uh, things like the ejector stacks on the uh, lower right, those are aluminum tubing, just KNS aluminum tubing, but the lathe is used to do the flaring on the end consistently with a wooden tool, a hard wooden tool, and you can just form that aluminum. And then of course you polish them once you're done by spinning them on the lathe. So I have a lot of those pieces up here after the formal part of the discussion, we can talk about that. Uh, I have a example here of this dry sump oil tank and I'll just run through the, the sections of how that was made very quickly here but first I started with a drawing uh, for me it helps to have the dimensions to refer back to rather than just start making chips let's make a drawing first of the basic dimensions that we need diameter length that sort of thing so we know what we're doing and then you start with a straight piece of aluminum stock close to the size of the piece you want to end up with so you don't have a lot of waste. And in this case, it was 3 8 uh, inch aluminum stock. Uh, I faced the rod end and then turned the OD down to that 0.354 diameter, then drilled the end for the cap, goes across to the top there, then turned the, the spigot for the end, the 83 thousandths diameter, and then brought the tool in the 31 thousandths for the length, then turned the OD down to the, uh, to the other diameter, this middle band is the biggest diameter, that's the 354, and then on either end of that you have the tank diameter of 333, so that, that next step shows making that end, and so in effect what I'm doing is working one end of the tank at a time. So this now has almost that end complete, now I turn the 30 degree angle, so now that end is starting to look like the top of the tank or the bottom. Then I polished it with some Scotch-Brite pad. Then I went back and turned the 30, 33 diameter behind that middle band before I cut the part off. And a, a lot of the, I'll call it the trick of machining, Mark will, I think, agree with this, is figuring out how am I going to hold this thing while I do the turning. 
And oftentimes, you realize too late, well, I should have turned that other feature before I cut it off. And then you start over again. Because oftentimes, that is the only way you're going to be able to to do certain features is you have to machine them before you cut the part off and, and handle it another way. Can, can I add some? Please um, do. Another thing to think about is how are you going to, as you say, get it, you have to figure out how you're going to get the part off the stock before you start. Figuring out which end you're going to work on and how it's going to end. For example, you have the, uh, you have to drill a hole in the end of this, yes. but the other end doesn't need a hole. Or, or, it or, or, or it may not. Right. But if, if you've got one end that needs a hole and the other doesn't, maybe you want to do the end, even if it's upside down. Mm -hmm. So planning ahead all the way through, uh, it's so much fun to get on to start cutting. And everybody's gotten to the point where it's... Love to make chips. Um, yeah, I've made a part that I'm never going to use. <laughs> I've got a lot of them. But they become something else often. Uh, but planning ahead to the point where thinking it all the way through to how you're going to get it off is probably the single most important trick to successfully making less parts. True, yeah, very true. And, and that's one of the things that, you know, when you first start working with it, you feel like you're kind of out on thin ice wondering if I'm really doing this right. But after 25, 30 years, it'll be just old hat. <laughs> you'll be real accustomed to doing that, so. You'll get used to throwing away parts and it doesn't hurt after a while. It doesn't bother you, because it's all experience. It's all learning. So then, at that point, I cut the part off. So now, the upper left-hand picture, you can see I have basically a half-finished part. The upper part is complete finished, but the bottom below the, the middle band is yet unfinished. So now, in this case, I'm forced to actually now hold the part on that pre-finished diameter, that 333 diameter. So in this case, I make a brass sleeve to act as a protective collet. So that, because if I just chuck that aluminum part up in the three jaw chuck, I'm going to have three dents in it. And that's not going to look good. So I make a brass sleeve that takes the, the force of the chuck and distributes it around the diameter of that part so you don't end up with uh, the marks. Question? Do you know if you use any C5 collets? He's asking if I use collets. I do have a set of collets and have used them. Uh, it depends on the diameter. Because, like with a 333 diameter, I'd have to cut my own collet. Because collets, for those of you wondering what we're talking about, if you have a pin vise that has a removable collet, or your Dremel tool has removable collets that have set diameters, like for your Dremel tool, you'll have one with an eighth inch hole in it, one with a sixteenth, and one with something in between, I think. You get a metric too. You metric too, and then like a, a pin vise will have like four different sizes, and you have to change depending on what size drill you put in. Lathes and mills have the same kind of system. They have uh, these expandable collets that are only designed to grip a part of a very specific diameter range. They're nice because they distribute the, the clamping load around the whole diameter of the part, but they're very specific. Now, if you're making a very important part, a very critical part, uh, and that's the only way to hold it, you may have to make your own custom collet to hold that part. And in fact, that's what I've done here with the brass sleeve. Yep. One Another. Randy uses brass. I use brass often. Um, I found PVC from Home Depot. Oh, makes, yes. makes a great Good soft point. jaw um, safety collar. Yep, great idea. Yeah, they're cheap, it's cheap stuff. Yep, another question. Is there an issue when you do that brass of the piece? Okay, Art asks if there's any problem with the part rotating, rotating true because of using the brass sleeve. And there can be. And what I often do to avoid that, because a chuck, a three-jaw chuck, has a certain amount of run out. And by that, I mean, if you put a piece of stock in that chuck and start it rotating, it may not be spinning exactly on center. And so the part is going around in an oval pattern, not an oval pattern, but it's going uh, yeah, centrifugal or non-concentric. Let me say it that way. Um, so I'll end up marking the part I'm working on to line up with the zero jaw on the chuck. Each of my three jaws have markings on them. So then when you clamp it back in, it's in the same orientation. Now, if you really want to avoid that, use a four jaw chuck and you dial in the part because then you can true it up. And I can explain that afterwards. That's, that's probably the next class. <laughs> but anyway, so then clamped it up, <coughs> excuse me, and then completed the machining on the back side, similar to the front side, then I had the finished part and just drilled the holes and added aluminum tubing for the spigots 
and I brought that piece along so you can see it afterwards. But the whole thing, you know, takes maybe half an hour, maybe a little bit, uh, a little bit longer to do uh, an aluminum tank. And it has the advantage of you don't have to when you get to that point in your project, you don't have to get an order off to detail master or whoever and, and hope the part's the right size to fit your project. You can make it exactly the size and, and shape you want. So now I'll turn it over to Mark. You may want to come around front. And these are some of the examples of his work using uh, a mill. So Mark, thank you. Um, on the upper left is a pair of brake rotors um, for the current model that's downstairs. Uh, made a 6061 aluminum. They were, I'd made the wheels first since I had the lug pattern indexed into and measurements in my mill on my uh, rotary table. It was easier to make the rotors at the same time. That way I ensured that they would fit the wheel. Um, I've got cogs for the timing assembly on the front of the engine. Uh, again, all done on the mill. Um, I use a rotary table and a, and a tilt table to get the different angles. Uh, the tank, uh, there's two tanks there, the one on the, on the right, on the upper right corner. Done pretty much the way Randy uh, described. Um, pretty much following the same procedure. I did most of the work on that on the lathe, actually. Um, did a lot of the detail work on the, on the mill for the fittings. Uh, the fire extinguisher body, for example, that was done on the lathe. And the, the head on it is actually raw leftover resin from whenever I'm casting. I just throw it up in the cup and keep it. And just freehand milled it. So one of the benefits with the, the mill, other than being, as well as being uh, able to cut true things, you can actually sit there with both hand wheels and freehand cut, just like you're whittling, and get those odd curved shapes. It's really not that hard. It's, uh, it's kind of like a 3D etch a sketch, isn't it? It's very much like that. I was never good at the etch a sketch, but the cool part with this is it's going so slow, you can make incremental adjustments. And when it's all, all said and done, you can sand it and adjust it by hand. Um, there's a master cylinder assembly in the middle picture that was mostly done on the mill. Uh, even the, the bottom looks like it's the body, the body of the, uh, the cylinder. That was actually done upright on the mill. And uh, I was able to cut the flange, the uh, this diagonal, hexagonal, parallelogram. Uh, it was all cut into one piece uh, because it was on the mill. I was able to cut it off from the top and then cut the, I guess the diamond shape would be a better way to put it. Um, the wheels, uh, the actual outer rims were done on the lathe, but the center sections, I have a copy of the, the master over here. That was done on the mill, and it took about 10 hours just to do that center piece. Um, the distributor, Yeah, that was done on the lathe also. That's not a mill part. Oh, so the cap was actually done on the mill out of brass, and they used k &S tubing for the individual uh, little boot pieces sticking up there. Uh, the center bottom picture is a bunch of stuff I made on the mill. Uh, <laughs> okay, they, uh, there's a head in the bottom that was uh, out of 7075 aluminum, just chucked up uh, in a vise on the, I should say viced up on the table, on Little by little, yes, Rob. Uh, what do you buy the? Excuse me. What do you buy the aluminum? Um, I got lucky in the seventy seventy five. My neighbor's uh, aero, aerospace machinist and brings home scraps. Yeah. And everything else I get from industrial metal supply over in Santa Ana. I guess it's Irvine now. I, uh, the question was, where do you source the aluminum? So, okay, where would we source our aluminum and brass and things? Uh, there's a couple places. There's online metals. They have a great assortment of and will sell you small quantities. Also, Metal Express is another place that uh, you can get uh, brass and aluminum and steel and different things. Reasonably priced. Well, I'm looking at everything. I, I, anything that gets scrapped is yeah. an aluminum. It goes in the bin. Um, I've got a box of aluminum that I just, my neighbor's throwing away something that looks like brass or aluminum. It goes in the box. As long as you have your eyes open, just like anything modeling, you look at something that could be a part. Well, the scrap metal, all of a sudden, those could be parts too. Next one. Sure. Um, this is basically how I made that wheel. I started with a, a chunk of 6061, and you can see the three jaw chuck there. So it's sitting vertical in the mill. In the upper left corner, you can see the end mill, and just roughed out the OD and the ID. And I purposely left that center section, that big chunk so I could grab it from the other side. This is the back of the wheel in the upper right corner. And I've got it on the lathe and did some other roughing out on the bottom left. Um, 
in some cases it's quicker to cut on the lathe than the mill and there's no sense burning through the sharpness of your end mill bits when you've got a uh, easily resharpenable uh, lathe, lathe tool. Uh, once I've roughed it out and I've flipped it over and you can see I'm starting to cut the basic five, uh, five spoke design and the lugs to keep everything true this is all done pretty much at one time. And I just kept fleshing it out little by little. Um, I did have a photo of the wheel I wanted to copy in front of me. Didn't have any measurements, but I did have the measurements of what I had to fit. And just progressed farther and farther along, cut into the center. Um, and I just, just kept cutting until it came out, basically. Yeah, and uh, uh, it ends up being one of the things I did want to mention, and I'm glad, I don't know if these are Marks or Don's, but whoever brought this, thank you. I didn't bring mine. Everybody knows what, what these are. A pair of calipers. Do yourself a favor, even if you don't have a mill or a lathe, save your money and buy a pair of calipers. You can get them at Harbor Freight on sale for $16 yeah. for the digital ones. Digital ones, right? Buy two. They're, they're well, indispensable. They places. Indispensable for when you're machining, but even when you're just doing non machining regular building. Because I check the size of, all right, is this the right size? sheet to use here. Is it too thin, too thick? How about this diameter for the plug wires? What should they be? So With the calculator. With the calculator. For me, I've got a calculator and a calipers. Yeah. And what I'll do is I'll figure out what size something should be and scale it. Does it look right? Sometimes it doesn't look right. So then you have to fudge it. And you look to see what looks right. You measure that. Go the other direction. Does it measure right? And find that, that, that happy medium. Balance. Yes. And a lot, if you made everything perfectly scale and model, it probably wouldn't look right. It would be correct, but it wouldn't look right. Yeah. So there's that, that fine edge of you know, finessing it. I don't know if it's art or, or science. <laughs> or it's, religion. It's, it's not cheap. Yeah, no, no. Yes, Rob. Uh, so when you're doing the spokes, like on, on the spokes, you had um, little grooves on there. Yes. What do you do to stop it from going too far when you're, when you're going across? Uh, my machine is not. Um, actually, what I did on that for the can you move forward one. Yeah. Uh, is it the right or left? You want to go back or forward? Uh, for, um, for example, the lower left picture. Um, my machine has a little bit of lash in it. I'm aware of it and I know where it is. But to keep everything consistent, um, I used an end mill that was the diameter that I wanted the width of that slot to be. I started in the center and worked out a set of a distance and went the other, other way and finished at the end, pulled it up, went to the next. And that way I ensured that both sides are exactly, that each slot is exactly the same length. And also, you cut very slowly. Do you count the number of turns? Or well, as, as Randy alluded to, on, on the Sherline yeah. stuff, you've got 50 thousandths per turn. Right. So I am counting it, but it's not that it's 50, it's not so many turns, it's a set distance. Well, I don't have the exact measurements. On the, on the hand wheels, oftentimes they'll have marks. Mark it, is, on it is calibrated, so when you, when you turn it, you can read it. It but moves usually by a thousandth of an inch. Each, each increment is a thousand. So you can see that up here on Don's afterwards and so, so you follow that and you end up doing a lot of math uh, dividing by two is, is about as complicated as it gets or multiplying by two that's great but one, one really important accessory that you need to think of and I know I'm sure when you have an option to bind it or not they're called zero reset dials yes and um, it makes your life Immensely easier. Yes, yeah. very good. Uh, what he's talking about is the hand wheels on these, I don't know if these are resettable. They're, they're calibrated, so yeah. as you spin them, they, they correlate to the settings that are on the table. Uh, Surline offers up this nice feature where the band that's attached to the wheel is adjustable and lockable. So you, once you zero, you find a, a center of where you've got your part. You can zero everything out and reference off of it. Once you've made those cuts, you can recenter it off of something else, re-reference it, zero to that. Right. And if you get lost, you can just redo it again. Yeah. yeah, now mine doesn't have that feature, but so when I'm doing an operation, I have to remember, okay, I started with the counter at 37, and so now I'm going 20 thousandths from that, so I go up to 57. So it, again, it's just some quick addition, subtraction math. Very Question, Stephen? I just had a comment. I bought zero adjustable handles. That was the best thing since sliced bread. Yeah. And then I got digital readouts, <laughs> and that's even better. Yeah. <laughs> Stephen's talking about going from uh, fixed, yeah. fixed increments to the zero adjustable to the digital readout, and just the progression there. And the digital readout is really the way to go. A little bit more pricey, but you can they have those readouts for mills and for the lays as well. But I wouldn't go with any less than zero adjustable. Zero adjustable, yeah. 
Another question, okay. Stephen. Okay, guys, if, if you spend 10 hours doing a wheel center, mm -hmm. do you do that four times or do you do a resin casting? Okay, on, on mine, this ten is hour, my, okay, 10 hours on the wheel center is the question. Now, do you do that? Three more times, well, in this or do you do a resin cast? In this particular case, I was going to do a wheel that has a, a, a painted finish or an industrial finish. Uh -huh. So I knew I only had to make one. But this is the third time I did it. Because each time, well, the, first, the first one I got it looking pretty close, and I thought, you know, I think it would look better no, I'm, this I'm not, way. I'm not talking about attempts. Well, no, this, <laughs> but this is the third attempt, and it took 10 hours. Okay. The other ones only took eight because I gave up, realized, right. okay, I know where I screwed up, right. but now I know how to do but, it right. But the real question is, would you machine four parts, or if, do you, well, or no, do you use that. one as a master? Um, I did a Camaro a few years ago that it's all, all the wheels are all machined, all raw, polished finish. So there's four different wheels, all different, or all made the same to look the same with two different offsets. Okay. This one, knowing going in that I'm only going to cast them, I mean a master instead of making the parts. Okay. So just you yeah. have to make that value judgment. When that's you get another started. that's another part of that. Knowing what you're what you're making it for before you start pays off in the long run. Right. Another question? I saw a hand up, sorry. Oh, oh there. Um, have you guys ever done uh, any C and C work? The question is if we've ever done any C and C work, <laughs> which is computer numerical control. And what that is, for those of you maybe not familiar with that term, is instead of Mark or myself turning the hand wheel and counting thousandths of an inch, that is a servo motor turning that hand wheel and counting the thousandths of an inch and referencing back to a program that somebody wrote to make a part to look like a certain thing. The answer is no, I have not. I'm familiar with it from seeing it in use, but I have not ever used it. And the second question, no one's been able to tell me the difference between two different types of aluminum when it comes to machining. What, what, what two different types? types? The question is the two different types of aluminum. Yeah. There are different grades of aluminum. Right. 6061, 6082, 6030-something. You've got 2024, yeah, you've got 7075. You've also got T6 hardening. That yeah. refers to the hardening, not the alloy. So you can get different alloys that are hardened and unhardened. 6061 is, for me, the... the the workhorse. It, work, it does too. everything. Okay. I like 7075 because it's a little harder. Um, it polishes really well for intricate things. If you want to do a steering wheel, it's very fine detailed. 7075 is the go-to for me. Uh, this wheel is going to bulk. It's, it's great. 2024 is real soft, kind of gummy. That's pretty much what you get when you buy the K&S stuff. It right. polishes really well. It bends really well. Machining is not so nice. But if you can machine it and polish it, it'll it'll be the shiniest. In fact, going back to the point, uh, with your, your injector stacks, I would choose yes. to use 2024 because of the ability of it to stretch. To stretch and then polish. Yeah, and if you use 6061, it's, it's likely to crack, especially if it's hardened, T6 hardened. So, uh, yeah, don't get too uh, intimidated by all those numbers and alloys and things. It's In the end, it's really not important. Uh, you'll end up with a, a box full of aluminum pieces and, and try one and if it works for you, great. If not, try a different alloy. It, it may be a more important way to look at it is if, if it's real soft and you can bend it or uh, dent it with your thumbnail, it's probably going to be too soft to machine uh, anything that's got any strength to it. Right. So you might want to right. pass so on now that. I, but now it, I it, think I understand the problem because if you get the K&S stuff and try and make a uh, brake bleed or something like that, it's it, just... It's just it's very, yeah, it's very, it's very mushy. Okay. Yeah, the K&S is, uh, I think it's close to the 2024, 20, 25, whatever. It's very soft. Yeah, it is a very it's, soft aluminum. It's great to work with an exacto knife and actually whittle old fashioned. Yeah. But, to, yeah, it doesn't, in fact, I've had it many cases where I've chucked it up and just the force of the end yeah. mill against it falls over. Yeah, right. Okay. Another question, Stephen? I was just going to point out, even the K&S brass is, is pretty soft for machine. Yeah, there, uh, he's pointing out that the KNS brass is soft machine. There are different grades of brass as well. One would leave that out. There's half hard and hard brass and dead soft brass. And again, it's a matter of experimenting with, with what you're trying to make and what process you're using to make it. And some works better than others. So uh, you don't have to be a metallurgist or a chemist to figure it out. You just gotta kind of work with it and experiment with it. And a lot of the information <coughs> is online. Just Google it or whatever. And it's amazing what you can find. Just ask a question. And that's how it works. Somebody else has already, Somebody else has already out. asked that and answered it. Yeah. So, any other, another question? It's more, I guess, uh, just comment to the whole uh, industrial metal supplies. A couple different things. Just, we have, but you can ask for gremlins. 
Yes, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, at IMS, they have a whole area, and everything is painted blue. For example, aluminum, yeah. you just buy it by the pound. The last time I went, it was two sixty-five a pound. It might be up to like two ninety-five. Another source is McMaster Car. McMaster Car has yeah the stock as well. Yeah. Okay. And the guys behind the counter are usually really helpful. Yeah. Don't be afraid to ask. And, Question, Andy? And we can find metal, all metal we want on eBay, too. Oh, eBay metals, he's saying, is another yeah, another source for been, metal stock. You know, I've been buying up scraps of titanium. Okay. And titanium is sold. really tough on a shirt. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, it sounds. <coughs> huh? It sounds. Get that sharp carbide in, though. Yeah, it'll take your high-speed steel out in two cuts. Yeah, yeah well, there's, there's a chemical reaction. Yeah, it's more of a novelty thing to play with it. Other questions? All right. Well, then, I'd invite anybody who's interested to come up and look at some of these parts. And we're going to try to do a, a quick, easy demo of making a simple part here on Don's lathe that he's right, graciously brought for us. So, another Mike, question? Right. Can you make a 3D printing <laughs> Maybe he could. <laughs> I, I, Mike's question was about making a 3D printing machine, and I would say save that question for the for the next <laughs> seminar <laughs> for the 3D guys. Lynn and the company would be glad to answer that. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you all for your time, your attention, and again, come on up here. We'll answer questions and have you take a look at the the lay here. So thank because they're, they're very narrow and they tend to be tall in section and, and that's what you use. It's also called a parting tool. When you're finally finished with the part, you use this to remove it from the stock and so it doesn't waste a lot of stock because it's a nice narrow uh, surface there. But uh, in effect, you just start turning. And usually for aluminum, you want to turn it really fast so you get a good surface finish. But for this demo, I'm not going to get too carried away with that. So we're going to bring the tool in and just take a small cut across the face. So you taste off with a cutting tool? I'm doing this with just a square edge cutting tool. And you can bring a tool in. I couldn't find one in his assortment to come across. So when you're using aluminum or, or plastics or brass, you, you get away with a lot of uh, setups that wouldn't be appropriate for steels and things. So now I'm going to advance the tool in, and these are those dials that we're talking about, and each increment is a couple thousandths of an inch, it appears, from his, and then we'll take another cut across that face. And one of the other tricks I'll call it is that when you get down close to your finished dimension, you can you can take pretty big cuts getting to that point. You can cut 20, 30 thousandths at a time. But when you're pretty close to where you want to be at the end, then I'll take just a few thousandths, maybe only even a one thousandth cut, and I'll advance the tool very slowly. And that will give you the best surface finish that you can achieve with, with the setup you have. Now another trick, let me advance that tool again. And what you should do is take your cut. And now I'm at the center. Now to avoid dragging the tool back across that face, I back this off and then back this tool off so I don't drag the tool back across that face, I just machine very carefully. Because of lash in the, in the equipment, you're going to have the opportunity to cut material when you really didn't want to, because of just the way the tool, and, and you'll get a feel for that as you, as you work your equipment a little bit more. So then, I'm going to take a little bit of a cut off of the OD. We'll make this sort of like a, uh, a, a brake rotor. We'll take a small cut off this face. And again, now I'll back 
take this off before I back the tool out. And that's the one side then of the of the rotor. Now we'll change to the cutoff tool. Now when you set that cutting tool, do you want that to go past center or do you want that to just... You want it as center? close to center as you can get it. And I actually, my lathe has a, a quick change tool holder where you take all the time and get the tools all set up to center first and then you can swap them out. They just clamp in and clamp out and you don't have to reset centers. I also have a setup block that sets on the, on the ways and you can, it has a, a scribed line where the center of the chuck is and I can set the tools up pretty quick there. So now, come in here and we'll part this piece off. <coughs> this is usually one of the more, I don't know if I call it difficult, but uh, parting a piece requires the most strength in the part, you you want the tools as close to the holders as you can get them so you avoid chatter and vibration. You want the part as close to the chuck as you can get so you don't have a lot of deflection because there's a lot of load when you're just plunging in and cutting off the part. Wouldn't it? That part's gonna be pretty hot when it pops off. I know. That's why I'm leaving it lay on the okay. compound. <laughs> Everybody that's done it the not, first time, not that it's hot. Lessons. It just yeah. doesn't take me long to look at it. Yeah. yeah. It, take, it takes less time to burn your finger than you can get it out of your hand. Yeah, that's very true. So this is now the, the rough piece of the of the rotor, and this is where the lesson we talked about comes in. That I better have this whole face the way I wanted it because. I'm not going to be able to grip this part anymore and do anything more to that face. So if it's not the way I want it, it's too late. So, so now, we'll see if we can grip this here. 
Yeah. And take another light cut off that face end to remove the cutoff burr and to get it looking the way we want it to look in the end. And in some cases, that backside, that little burr can just be knocked off of the file. Yeah. Depending on what you're going right. to use. Depending on, on what you're visible or depending on what you want to do with it. Through a whole spindle, and you got some right. to it too. Right. You know, it's, it's better if you do that up front. As, as you were saying before, if you've done all this work on one axis and you flipped around, even if you indexed it, you're probably going to be off you like the it. center yeah. side. Okay. Now we'll just take one small cut off that face. Nope, not going to be able to do it because the tool holder is hitting the, the chuck. But in effect, that's what you would, that's where I would have to switch to one of the other tools with the angle on it and, and go in and cut that face. And if you want, you want to get the left hand cutter done. Yeah, that's what, he's got an angle going. I don't want to have to switch this around for him. Nope, the other hand, I think. Sorry. I guess I need the right hand. No, I had one of the other. Yeah. I don't know if this one's better. Yeah, this one should do it. I think it will. Or extend it. And I apologize, some of my fumbling around here is just my inexperience with Don's particular lathe and the tooling. When you have your own and you get accustomed to it, it becomes like second nature, adjusting things and, and getting it to work the way you want it to work. Also, yeah. I want to make sure that where I stand. Well, that has to be all the way down. Safety first. So now what you'll do is come in here until the tool just starts making a cut, and then you'll note where your indicator is, and you'll back off the piece. Advance the tool how far you want to cut off the piece. So that's re establishing your zero point after you unchuck and rechuck the part. thing we talked about was like drilling a hole in the center for a spindle mount. There, a, I don't know if you have a chuck that fits in here. We can at least show them the concept. We won't actually do the drilling. But this is called the tail stock and it has a, an advance on it. Thank you. And it holds a three jaw chuck. You put a drill bit in here, you advance this, you clamp it down with your drill against that part and then you advance it using this tail stock wheel and you can drill the part right through the center of the part, nice and centered. Um, I use this a lot on, on mine to do the center drilling. But again, we won't actually do the drilling, but that's that's the one feature of a lathe too. That, uh, and if you're turning long skinny pieces, you can actually get what's called a live center, which is an attachment that goes in the tailstock, has a point on it, and that point is mounted in a cup that rotates. And so you can clamp a long skinny part up in the chuck, have a drill point in the back end of it that that center fits in, and that supports the part so it doesn't deflect while you're trying to cut it. Oh, he does have a center. That's a this is a, a non-live center, but it serves the same purpose. So if you imagine a, a long piece in here that you were worried about deflecting, you would drill a drill point in the end of that, and then this would go into that center of that hole, and it would keep this piece from deflecting while you try to machine it. So, 
Again, all those little things that you that, 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 that you learn as you, you know, just experiment with it and, and learn with it. So that is a very quick, crude brake rotor, but that's the, the basic process that you, you would do. So questions? Comments, rebuttals, Check that up in your criticisms. <laughs> I object. <laughs> Shane, you mentioned clearing tubing for like injector tanks. Yes. Have you said you use a, like a curtain? I use a piece of like hardwood dowel that I've shaped and polished, and then with the piece turning in the lathe, I just form it, just push it. I even just pull it by the hand. I don't even clamp the tool in, in the compound. I just, just do it manually. You know, just push it over. Yeah, yeah, you actually you put for a, a lot of your little drill bits and things like that. So a little disc of beeswax from the sewing store okay, is, is great because it comes in a little holder. They use it for, for lubricating and sewing needles. But I use it for all my miniature bits, pin bites. I use it for cutting tools sometimes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. hand tools. Yeah, it's like a, this is like a wood turning chisel. Yeah, yeah. But you can do that for simple things. Yeah, yeah. 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 Y